Hello and welcome to the Northwood Podcast. I am Heath Jones, your host. And I'll start by naming a reality that surrounds me. This is a busy week and, and I'm on a time crunch, so I'll try and keep this first part brief. First, uh, you may well hear quite a lot of background noise today. Uh, we have summer camps going on here, a couple of schools um, and, and groups at Lee Space in our building are having their summer camps. And so I've been hearing shouts and screams and even loud music up until just a few moments ago, uh, all morning. So apologies, uh, as it is very likely that we're going to be interrupted more than once as we go through. So I'll just try to tune it out and work through it unless it's just so bad that I have to have to stop. Hopefully we won't. Uh, moving on, uh, we want you to know that this podcast is a ministry of my church, Northwood Christian Church, but is produced by the All Indiana Podcast Network, uh, which is an affiliate or is under the aegis of Wish TV. It's a local um, station here in Indianapolis, Channel 8. Uh, you can find out more about the podcast that they produce at www.wishtv.com backslash podcasts. And, and there you'll be able to find a wide array of podcasts that are produced here in Indiana by Hoosiers, hence the name All Indiana Podcast Network. We're a part of that. I encourage you to check them out. Or... If you'd like to learn more about our church, please visit our website at www.indync.org. That's ndncc.org. And there you'll be able to find a basic information about us and, and how you can reach out and, and make connections. Uh, or you can just write in directly to me at Heath, H-E-A-T-H, that's my name, that's my name, um, at ndncc.org. That's Heath at ndncc.org. And I would love to hear some more about those of you who are listening in a direct way. Or if you are wanting to engage, but not so directly, please feel free to leave a comment below in the comment section of this video. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, that's where you might do that. Um, you might uh, like it or um, give it a thumbs up while you're at it. But if you're listening to this as a podcast, you may not have those options. So please subscribe or follow or leave a rating uh, on whatever app that you use. Apple's podcast um, app, Spotify, TuneIn, radio, iHeartRadio, whatever you use to listen. Uh, giving us just really any mo point of engagement, I'm told, really helps bring more traffic our way. And also it'd be great, probably more importantly, be great to get some feedback so that we can improve um, so that we can reach more people. And here, I said I'd be brief at the start. Turns out, I guess not. Uh, but moving on, um, here in a moment, we're going to be going over a rather lengthy passage in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, but first, we'll need to pause for an ad break for our podcast audience. So here is our, our ad break. One, two, three, back in a moment. And the moment has passed, and we're back. Uh, the, the Bible passage that we'll be focusing on is found in the Gospel of Matthew, as I was saying, chapter 10, verses 24 through 39. And that's, well, a few words of warning before we dive in. Uh, one, this is a longer reading than we usually do, and each part does flow into the next, but I acknowledge that it, it's a lot to take in, kind of like information through a fire hose. So if you struggle to stay with me as I read, I understand. It's not you. It's probably just the length of the passage that we've, we've selected. Uh, so so just you know, try to get through it as best you're able. But also, I want you to know that this reading, as dense as it is, has a lot to reflect on, and we can't cover everything today. So if the text raises a question as we move along that I don't address, just right into me. I'd love to take a crack at finding an answer for you. So with all that being said, let's get into it. Matthew chapter 10 verses 24 through 39. That's Matthew chapter 10 verses 24 through 39. And it reads, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. 
and even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You uh, are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Well, there you have it. As I was saying, there's a lot there, uh, perhaps maybe more you could take in all at once, but uh, we'll stick to the main points. And either way you cut it, this message, this message is a rough one. There's probably no getting around it. And perhaps my title itself gave the whole thing away. I entitled this Through the Tension. And what tension, you ask? Well, I have in mind here the tension, the stress, the struggle even that comes from living into Jesus's gospel message. More specifically, I'm thinking here of the tension between you and those you're in relationship with, whether they be friend or family member, church member even. And in this vein, those last verses really bring the problem into stark contrast with every other nice and feel-good line that we might find in some other place in the Bible. You know, personally, I like lines in the Bible. Uh, I like sayings from the mouth of Jesus even that go something like, love your neighbor and pray for those who persecute you. He said that, and that sounds really nice. Like we're just maybe a hop, skip, and a jump away from world peace even. Except you know how it has gone since Jesus said those words. And he also said what we just read, verse 34 of Matthew chapter 10, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And I once had that verse quoted at me uh, from a man who wanted to use this verse as an excuse to do violence in the name of Jesus against his enemies. And I think that such a thought is is very nearly, if not entirely blasphemous, to do such a thing in the name of Jesus. Not to mention that this is entirely to miss the point either way. To put into context that line, it's meant to describe by way of metaphor the nature and the divisions and the tensions that belief in Jesus may cause between you and those who are your immediate relationships and those in your community even. So it's not saying go and do violence. It's saying that just believing in Jesus will bring divisions like a sword cuts and makes two sides of what's cut Two sides, a rift in your family. So of this, biblical scholar and professor and commentator Cleophas L. LaRue writes, it is quite likely that the community for which Matthew wrote had experienced such family divisions and that some followers had even been turned out of their families. His coming calls forth, his being Jesus, his coming calls forth decisions every day of our lives as to whom we will serve. A person's family could well become the enemy if familial love seeks to replace the love of Christ, end quote. So no, Jesus is not sanctioning violence in that line in the name of the gospel. Rather, saying, I came not to bring peace but a sword, it's a lament. He's lamenting the reality that his message liberates, but it also divides. And he had experienced this in his own life. There, there's a story just later in chapter 13, just moments after this, this chapter that we're reading now, 
or Jesus will be rejected by his entire hometown, the people that raised him. And later after that, even Jesus' own friends abandon him at his crucifixion. So call that a division. Uh, I'm sure it cut Jesus like a sword, and it nearly always does hurt that way. In the passage that we just read from Matthew chapter 10, Jesus predicts fractures in the relationships between his disciples and their close kin and community. He mentioned son against daughter, daughter against mother. Even the in-laws are fighting against each other. And I think that we've come to appreciate this lament in recent years, how a message that some hold to be liberating can be received as a message of oppression by other communities. And you know, who's right in the end? I, I am sure that many of Jesus' protagonists approached him in good faith believing God was on their side. But it is only in retrospect that we pass more sound moral judgments about which side of these conflicts from the past held the higher moral ground. Who, whose side was God on anyway? So I emphasize sound moral judgments because I think that we can, in many issues, determine uh, that there are clear right and wrong sides in many of these conflicts in the past. And in the story we're reading, we always think Jesus is on the good side. But there are other instances in history where, where there were conflicts where we, we name in retrospect a clear, a clear a side that held the higher moral ground. For instance, I, I feel absolutely no hesitation in naming my conviction that it is a good thing that the Confederacy was not able to maintain slave markets and an economy that was built on the backs of captive humans call me crazy, but that, that is, I think that the, it was wrong that the economy was built on the backs of God's children without their consent, all for profit. Call me crazy, as I said, but I, I think that Jesus approves of the abolition of slavery, and I don't think that Jesus wants us to own a fellow child of God so as to exploit them for their labor, or for any other reason for that matter, I suppose. But I'm nearly certain that you probably agree with that. I feel that most people today feel this way, and I'm so glad we do. I'm just trying to make the point. We, many of us feel this way in hindsight. We didn't have to fight the fight in those times because in the mid-1800s, houses were divided over the issue. Families split brother against brother, fighting against each other with, the, with bullets and blades, each side convinced of the righteousness of their side. And we fought a civil war here in America over this issue, and, and you know what? The words... Deo Vindicae were inscribed on, on many of the Confederates' memorabilia because it was their national motto. Vin, Deo Vindicae means, quite literally, with God as our defender or our protector. So they believed God was on their side, those that owned other humans. So get, did God support the cause of the South, as they believed? Thing is, both sides of many a conflict feel as though they hold some higher moral ground. All sides of the Second World War believed that God was on their side. The Allies held national days of prayer. The Japanese believed they held a divine mandate. The German soldiers wore the words Gott mit uns on their belt buckles, which means God is with us. That's what they wore in World War II. The Nazis, God on our side. So are you noticing a theme? Similar dynamics prevailed during the civil rights movements of the 1960s. Households were divided over the issue of civil rights for black and brown people. And children who supported the work of Dr. King and others, they would argue with their parents into the evenings. And, and then sometimes the parents would argue amongst themselves and people would divide and split over this issue as to whether or not the civil rights movement was a movement for justice or perhaps a movement of God's spirit, or something else. Some communist plot to undermine capitalism, some thought, as conspiracy theorists posited at the time. In each of these instances, we, we see in retrospect, with the moral clarity hindsight affords, that although there were avowed Christians on all sides of these conflicts, the gospel really only could call them in one direction toward liberation. 
God was always for the end of chattel slavery in America, the end of Nazism in Europe and, and in America, and the fall of Jim Crow laws and segregation, all of that, apartheid in South Africa, whatever, what have you. We, we see this now, that God was for the sides that led to liberation for more people. We hold on to this conviction, but we take it for granted. Because in their day, the freedom fighters, the abolitionists, the activists who stood up to these forces were fighting against the grain in their time and in their communities. Some lost important relationships because of their willingness to hold a position that was perhaps unpopular in their country or in their homes or in their communities or in their churches or the places that they occupy. Some lost jobs. Some were blacklisted from working in their respective industries. Some, like Martin Luther King Jr., were killed. Others were killed. You know, in, back when, Jesus was killed. And before that happened, though, Jesus faced opposition in his ministry consistently. Sometimes he had up and leave town after raising a ruckus for good. I mentioned that earlier. His hometown rejected him. And this is why Jesus reminds his friends in verse 26 that we read up above about how a disciple is not above their teacher. In short, he is saying that they can expect the same hardships and persecutions that their teacher experiences, the same things that happened to Jesus, because Jesus knows that hard times come to any and all who fight these good fights. And disciples of Jesus, will, they will be demonized in every age. And Jesus made an allusion to this in verse 25, that, that little line about Beelzebul, which is another name for the devil. And Jesus says, they call me that. They call me the devil. People call Jesus the devil. Probably sincere, well-intentioned people called him that. He says, if they call me that, they're going to call you that. How much lower will they regard the devil's disciples? And that may well mean, in 2023, you and me. So now, after Jesus said all of this, perhaps the disciples are afraid. That's where all that talk about, do not be afraid, comes in. Jesus knows they're going to be afraid. And perhaps after I said this, you were made anxious as well. You may have thought, does this mean that I will face hardships for following Jesus? And does this mean that some of the pushback may potentially come from those close to me? It makes me anxious too, and the answer to these questions may be yes. But even so, Jesus wants us to take heart, to not be afraid. Hear this moment, because that's really what Jesus wants his disciples to know. People, are, it's going to divide. The, the gospel will cut communities like a sword but don't be afraid. This is what Jesus ultimately wants us to know, that we don't have to be afraid, even through the tension. And so to help us out, he contextualizes the suffering his disciples may face along the way. So just hear him again, quoting from the text. He says, in response to the apprehension that may come through these divisions, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Or my paraphrase, sparrows may fall, but God does not abandon them. Persecutions may come, divisions and tensions, but God is right there holding, comforting, giving words of wisdom. So do not fear those that may disparage you. There are worse things. Tear you down with words, trash your reputation, or even do harm to your body. In the end, we lose our lives to find a greater love. That's what it says in the last verse that we read, that we take up our own cross for the greater good in our own context, our time and place in history, and we lose one form of life, true, in all of its safety and security, perhaps, but for something of greater value, for the realm of God and the pursuit of Jesus' vision. When a minority of Southern Christians came out against slavery during the American Civil War, they took, they took great risk upon themselves. That's what Jesus is talking about. They, they had to die to themselves, setting aside their own safety for the sake of of the call of the gospel, that the call of the gospel placed on their lives, that was their cross to bear. 
German Christians who opposed the Nazis for the sake of the gospel did the same. And the heroes of our continued civil rights struggles here in America and other places across the world gave and still give, giving their life, their energy, their effort, taking up their cross in pursuit of something of higher value. And, and those that wish to join in similar struggles today would do well to remember what Jesus said. In verse 39 that we read, those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. And that sounds severe, but consider the alternative. What happens when we instead choose to keep our life, our safety, our security, in the face of the challenging path Jesus would have us walk? What does it mean for someone to find their life, but still lose it in that sense? To maintain a safe status quo, but then to lose themselves in the process? Well, it may look like a plantation owner who would rather watch their property burn than release their slaves and change their ways. Or it might look like someone losing themselves as a Nazi officer, <laughs> fully committed to the cause, wholly lost in the toxic ideology and its perspective. It may look like quote-unquote decent Christian men, as they describe themselves then, turning fire hoses and dogs onto children, dumping ketchup onto the the heads of black people at segregated lunch counters and lynching, yes, even murder by those who called themselves Christians and defending what they thought of as their way of life and faith. So who loses their life when a murder is committed in that way? The victim certainly loses their life in the literal sense, but the murderer may well wreck their own soul in the process. That is, they lose their life on a deeper, more more significant level. So today, the movements toward liberation are still plucking away, but the work is as divisive as it ever was. And I can remember the way that those family and even church gatherings began to change in tone and temperature near and around 2016. What happened that year, I wonder. And that was a contentious election year, and our country was becoming increasingly polarized. It's a phenomenon that seems to have only accelerated since then. So many families they have begun to feel a sense of anxiety and even dread at family gatherings because of this sense that there may be differences between them and that they may well that those differences may well drive the fractures deeper. I hear this from congregants and friends all the time. So so what do you do? What do you do when that happens? Do you do you turn bait and run when the court when the sword is cut so deep? The sword that divides is cut so deep or do you hope for some avenues to reconciliation? Which, you know, as I frame that, that, we obviously are trying to look for avenues to reconciliation, but it's hard. Because, you know, the pandemic came, and then the year 2020, and another election came, but never went, as, as it still seems to be in the air, as we're arguing about that election still today. There was a storming of our nation's capital. I mean, need I say more? It has happened again. The sword has divided families and friends struggling to make it through the tension. I don't know how it has been with you, but I have been made sad as I witness hearts change. Hearts that were once filled with love, now filled with anger and fear. Fear that has risen to such a tenor that there is talk of even killing the bodies of enemies. They forget that we should not fear those that may kill our bodies, but they are afraid. And, and, and this, this, by the way, is a thought I wholly reject, just, just as an aside, doing violence to my enemies as, as I am wholly committed to nonviolence. But there are others I have heard, self-avowed Christians, that I have learned who do not reject the notion of doing violence. There are others who see pastors like me as on the wrong side because I support the LGBTQ community and their continued struggle for acceptance and inclusion in our society. I've learned of Christians who think that I'm on the devil's side for thinking that migrants and refugees should be cared for 
wherever we find them, simply because they are our brothers and sisters and children of God? That's a principle to live by at least, even if the logistics are complicated. I've learned of Christians who think I am on the devil's side for suggesting that the economy, driven by the logic of capitalism, which always and ever calls us to produce and acquire more, well, that way is devastating to our communities and to our planet. So you see, the sword still divides. I say things like this, and, and Christians, swords divide. The gospel divides, even between me and my closest friends and relatives. But I continue to try to answer the call I feel on my life, a call to explain how the gospel of Jesus calls us to advocate along with Jesus for those who need a voice. Jesus has told us that there is nothing they can do to our body than would be worse than losing our souls. Those that grow numb to the injustices that surround them may well lose their souls. And I hope I never cave to the fear and lose what matters most in here. I hope I can cut through the tension, maintaining my own sense of calling and what I think is right, but while also remaining in community with those others who think I'm on the wrong side of history or on the wrong side of the gospel, in fact. I don't think I am. I'm willing to talk to you about that if you disagree. But either way, the truth will win out. Just as the truth will win out in the struggles for racial, racial equality, I believe, so too will the truth set us free in these other regards. In the end, I gotta think that love wins out, especially between family members and friends. I gotta think that even though the gospel divides like a sword in each generation, there may well be paths to reconciliation and we should seek passionately for them. At least we must hope for this and you may not be able to help it if one of your loved ones, friends, or acquaintances rejects you for your attempts to live faithfully, but you can help how you respond. You can show by your actions that you will never leave or abandon those others in your life with whom there is this tension. Jesus held on through the tension until the very end when his friends rejected him and abandoned him, behaving little better than those who hated him. Even after all of this, Jesus met his disciples on the other side with love. They discovered that Jesus loved them enough to hold them through the tension. So I wonder if you or I might be challenged to do the same. I, I think we nearly always are challenged to try. And the church can be a sort of incubator for these these discussions. Theoretically, the church is a place where people of diverse perspectives and backgrounds may gather around a common belief in Jesus as our liberator. So the church could be, should be, a place where the tension is held and sifted through in love. See what happens. So all this to say, remain near those with whom you disagree. To the best of your ability, and if it causes you too much harm, well, you know what you maybe can take. But if you are truly on the right side of history, which I hear will use synonymously with the right side of the gospel, just for our purposes of this talk, then hold firm. The truth will win out. In the meantime, try and remain in communion with those who react in the fear and in the anger that Jesus is discussing here. Jesus himself continued to engage his opposition. He met with them in their homes, in fact, and he hashed things out over meals. And it could be that in time, you will arrive at a greater understanding with those in your life who perhaps maybe you've been holding at arm's length. It could be that they come around to, to your perspective, but you'll never know if you cut them out of your life. It leaves open possibilities if you keep them near. But in the end, I think that there is no other way than through the tension. I don't have an answer to resolve it, quite honestly. I don't know that it will be resolved in our lifetimes based on my observation of history and how things are going. <laughs> we can assume, at least based on how things are going, that the tension won't be resolved anytime soon. It'd be a miracle 
I pray for that miracle. So we must pass through it. But don't be afraid. Fight the good fight. Spread the good news of Jesus as best as you understand it, which calls for the liberation of all peoples, by the way. And this is a cause worth fighting for, even if the fight divides us. We, we may be in the den, in the muck, and in the mire during moments in history where it feels like we are going backwards instead of forwards. I think many people feel that way now, whichever side, side, wherever you are in life. But hold fast to hope. I really can't put in any better than Jesus did when he said, So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. And church, remember, perfect love casts out fear, says the writer of 1 John. So love those who resist you and do not fear them. Give your life for them if that's what it takes, giving of yourself to keep what matters most in the end, saving your heart, your spirit, through acts of love. God's eye is on even the sparrow that falls to the ground, which means God will keep you too through the struggle. What matters most will not be lost in the end. To participate in the work of Jesus is to find oneself. If we can continue to faithfully answer the call through the noise, the violence, the hatred, the greed, the lies, and the corruption that are rife in our current situation, then we might just keep our souls. And Jesus says, we will.